Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In this first video for lecture nine, uh, we're gonna talk about the idea of a limit some more, which you will recall that in our previous video, we, we talked about the precise definition of a limit. And let's just say that that led to a little bit of difficulty. We had talked about this idea of error and allowance, that if we wanted to be sufficiently close to a Y coordinate, how much error should we allow in the X coordinate to guarantee things like that? Uh, this led to what we call the precise definition of a limit, uh, for which it was it was kind of difficult to, uh, to, to really understand what was going on there. We, we did prove uh, the limit of a line was such and such, but it was very, very difficult. Uh, let's, in this video, introduce more of an intuitive notion of what a limit is, and we'll try to draw connections between these two notions. Uh, and I, I think this will help simplify a lot of the concerns we might have seen previously. So imagine we have a function f of x equals x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. This is a standard rational function, and we might be asked to, you know, to evaluate what is f of 1. Like if we were just to directly substitute in the value x equals 1 to this function, what would we get? Well, by direct substitution, f of 1, you're going to replace each of these x's with a 1. In which case, you're going to get in the numerator a 1 squared minus 4. Uh, 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 4 is a negative 3. In the denominator, you're going to get 1 minus 2, which is a negative 1. And so you see this double negative right here. Negative 3 divided by negative 1 equals a positive 3. So the function is 3 when x equals 1. So y equals 3 when x equals 1. We, this, is, this is a type of algebraic calculation that we do all the time. Now, why this is relevant to calculus is the next statement here. Let me draw it to your attention that it is also true that when x is a number very close to 1, then f of x is a number very close to 3. That is, if we accept a small amount of error above or below y equals 3, then there's a small amount of allowance to the left or right of x equals 1, which keeps y equals f of x inside of the margin of error. So you notice I squiggled and was eh, screechy with my voice. Why did I do that for very close? Well, when we say something's close, this is a relative term, right? Um, you know, if you were like sitting in a classroom and someone was sitting close to you, that probably means they're like a few inches away from you. It's like, hey, bub, I can smell you. Please, please scoot down a little bit. Um, but if you're an asteroid speeding through our solar system, if you're within like 10,000 miles of Earth, that's considered really close, right? Uh, closeness is somewhat relative, right? And so how, how do we make sense on these relative terms in any precise sense? How can I say really close when it depends on what type of astronomical scale are we on? Are we talking about close inside the galaxy? We're separated by a few light years. Are we close on like the quantum scale? Oh yeah, these things are like one nanometer away from each other. Or what, 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 what scale is going on here? So the definition, the precise definition of the, of the limit allows for us to be precise on what we mean by very close. By very close, it means if I prescribe for you some type of epsilon. So epsilon is greater than zero. So there's some positive amount. Epsilon we want to think of as a really, really, really small number, right? Uh, again, small is, is relative, right? But it's really, really small. So if we're just epsilon away from three, that's what we consider very close. And so in correspondence, what does it mean to be very close to one? It means that we have some delta greater than zero, right? There's some number delta so that if we're delta close to one, then we'll be epsilon close to three. So if we are close, delta close to one, then F will always be epsilon close to three, where of course we can derive delta given any epsilon whatsoever. Okay, so intuitively, we can understand what things like close actually mean. But from a quantitative sense, we do need to be more precise uh, because we can't, otherwise the ambiguity, we could get stuck in logical traps and things like that. That's the need for this epsilon delta stuff. All right, 
so why do we care about things being close, right? F of one equals three. Why does it matter if, you know, one, when you're close to one, the function will be close to three? Well, there are settings where we can't evaluate the function, but we can still talk about closeness. Let's take the same function and transition now to the number x equals two. You'll notice if you take your function f of x equals x squared minus four over x minus two, what happens when you plug in two, right? You're gonna get f of two. You don't see the doom that's approaching you. You get two squared uh, minus four over two minus two. The, the danger's coming. It's like in that horror film when you can hear the music. Then the, the person's like, don't go in that room. What happens? You end up with getting zero over zero. We just divide by zero. We blew up our universe. This function is undefined at x equals 2. f of 2 does not exist. D and E happening right here. So we can't evaluate the function at 2. But we can evaluate the function near 2. Because after all, if I look at f of 2.1, that's inside the domain. 2.1 doesn't make the denominator go to 0. Uh, 2 does. I could calculate it at 2.01. I could calculate it 2.001. I could calculate uh, 2.00000, lots of zeros, one at the end, right? All of those are going to be well defined because none of those make the denominator go to zero. That's the only problem with the domain. So I can get really close to two, right? Never touching, but I can get as close as two as you want. Uh, and so the proverbial family road trip, right? What happens, you know, at least this was the case when I was a kid, you know, we didn't have cell phones and Nintendo switches and things that we could bring in the car with us. We had to just stare at other cars as we're driving and look at a license plate. That's, that's what kids did to entertain themselves, you know? So what, what happened, of course, is the little brother, aka me, you know, I found enjoyment by pestering my older siblings, my older sister, right? So like how close, how close can I get to my sister with my finger without actually touching her? And then, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll whine, mom, Andrew's trying to touch me. It's like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I might be epsilon close, but I'm not touching you, right? We're not actually touching X equals two, um, but we can get really, really close to it. So it turns out that if we get really close never actually equaling, but if we get really close to two, the function's still defined. And what happens to the function? As we get really, really close to two, it turns out the function will get really close to y equals four. So even though f of two is undefined, there is a number that kind of suggests what it ought to be. What could f of two be if it, left, if it lived up to its potential? It could be four. Look at this. Look at this graph that we see right here. So you'll notice that when I'm saying things like, "Oh, you're going to get really close to x equals one," never actually touching it. But if I get numbers that get really, really, really close to x equals one, you'll notice coming up here and coming up here, right? If you get numbers really close to x equals one, your y coordinates will get really close to three. So as x gets close to one f of x will get close to 3, the y-coordinate, all right? Never actually using, I don't actually have to use the number 1 there. But what if we do the same thing for x equals 2? As my numbers get really close to x equals 2, like I'm getting numbers super close on the number line to x equals 2, then on the y-axis, your coordinates are going to get really close to 4. Now on the graph, you're going to notice this notation here that when you see this solid dot, it's sometimes called a closed dot. That means the point is included on the graph. One comma three is a point on the graph. F of one equals three. On the other hand, you sometimes see this notation right here. So sort of like this empty, not filled in dot. They sometimes call it an open dot. This open dot indicates that while our function gets close, our graph gets close to two comma four, it's not actually included on the graph. 2 comma 4 is not a point on the graph. f of 2 is undefined. It's not 4. It's not 17. It's not 5,280. f of 2 does not exist. But the graph gets really, really, really close to the point 2 comma 4. In fact, if I were to pick any, any acceptable amount of error, right, you could make you could make this, this strip right here as small as I want. I could pick any epsilon greater than zero. And that could be a really small number, right? I could take epsilon to be one, one trillionth 
are even smaller, right? Ant-Man can shrink as small, small down as he wants. He can get trapped in the quantum zone, and I could still pick an Epsilon smaller than that. And if I did that, there would always be there would always be some delta that I could find such that as long as I'm inside of the blue strip, then I'll land inside the yellow strip when I'm done. So I can focus in, I can zoom in on the point 2 comma 4 as much as I want, and it's never it's never going to fall outside of this box, no matter how small it is, as long as I'm near x equals 2. So even though the function is undefined at x equals 2, I can still look at the behavior of the graph near x equals 2. And that's what the idea of the limit was all about. So we say things like the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is equal to 4. Or in shorthand notation, we say this. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is equal to 4. So as x gets close to 2, f of x will get close to 4. That doesn't mean the function is defined at 2. It doesn't mean f of 2 equals 4. But it means the behavior of the function will be close to 4 when you get close to 2. It's also true that as x approaches 1, f of x will get close to 3. So no matter how close to 3 you want, you can always get close enough to 1 to guarantee that thing to happen. And so this is what we mean by this intuitive notion of a limit. Let, let's kind of revisit the definition, but now in this intuitive notion, right? So we say things like x approaches a from the left. So what this, how you want to interpret something like this is if you have a number line and you have some specific number right here, so maybe this is like our x equals a value right here. If we talk about approaching x from, uh, sorry, if x approaches a from the left, that means we're taking all these points on the number line that are getting closer and closer and closer and closer to x equals a, never actually touching a. And we will denote this as x arrow a, and you put a superscript of a negative one. That just means approaching it from the left. Because after all, if you're to the left of the, the y-axis, that's the negative side. If you're to the right of the y-axis, that's the positive side. So a superscript negative sign means you approach from the left. Um, similarly, we can talk about as x approaches a from the right. What this means is you're talking about a sequence of numbers that's approaching a from the right. Never touching a, but getting as close to it as you want. Closer than the brother trying to poke his sister without actually poking her, right? And so we denote this as x approaches a plus. That means you approach it from the right. And so with these shorthands, we can talk about the limit from the left or the left-handed limit or the limit from the right. So the limit, the left-handed limit of a function is the limit as you approach um, x from the left will be denoted the limit as x approaches a from the left. You see it right there of f of x. So this is saying if I were to get delta close to a on the left, what should I expect the function to do? So as, as you arbitrarily clo get closer and closer to x equals a, what happens to the y-coordinate? If you don't see the right-hand side, you can't see it, you can't see it. If you only see the left-hand side of the graph, into, what, what's the function behaving like? And similarly, you get the, you get the idea of a limit from the right. This is so-called right-handed limit. As x approaches a from the right, what is your function doing? That's called the right-handed limit. Now, if we want, if we allow approaching x equals a from both sides, this is the standard limit, sometimes called the two-handed limit, uh, the double-sided limit to emphasize it's both left and right. But if you just see me write x arrow a, that means as you approach x, uh, as x approaches a, which means you approach x from, you x approaches a from the left and from the right, this gives you the standard notion of the limit, the limit as x approaches a of f of x, like here. And so let's look at another example. This one's kind of similar to what we saw a moment ago. If I were to pick any number in the domain, let's like take x equals zero, right? As I get closer and closer to x equals zero, your y coordinates are going to get closer and closer to y equals one. And so then we would say something like the limit as x approaches zero for our function g of x right here, this is going to be one. If I pick the value, let's say, let's take um, x equals negative one right here. As I approach from the right, this is going to approach zero. So we'd say something like the limit as x approaches negative one from the right of g of x, this is going to equal zero. Um, if we were to approach it from the left, like so, if you approach it from the left, then on the graph, then your y coordinates getting closer and closer and closer to zero as well. And so you get the limit 
as x approaches negative 1 from the left of g of x, this is what we would say is 0. Now you'll notice that the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit agree in this situation. And so that's what we mean by the two-handed limit. The two-handed limit exists if and only if the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit exist and agree with each other. So we say the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x, this is equal to 0. Now the curious, the curious thing is about this one right here. Okay, you, this is the example of a removed point. We actually moved the point away and moved it somewhere else or over here. You look at this, there's like this black hole. Uh, the point 1, 2 seems like it ought to be on the function, but for whatever reason, this point's been moved up to 1, 3. Why 3, right? Well, you know, sometimes your, your, your parents are like, I want you to become a lawyer when you grow up. It's like, no, I love mathematics. I won't listen to you. You know, sometimes we don't always live up to our expectations. Sometimes we can find something better. But for some reason, this point has been moved away from the 1, 2. Now, in terms of the limit, the limit is looking for the expectation. If I were to pick some margin of error, then this value is going to predict this right here because we actually can't look. You know, let me let me kind of do this in a slightly different way, erasing my screen a little bit. Uh, what we what we're doing when we see this function is we actually can't see. We can't see what happens at x equals one. Aha! This is so clever. Right, you'll never be able to tell. I know, it's super clever here. But if I were to put this on the screen, it's like, hmm, I can see that x equals 1 should be around here. What do you expect the function to be doing? Well, the function expects to be like, if you're getting closer to 1, you get you, you seem to be getting close to here. If you, if you come from the other side, you seem to be here. So we see that the left limit as you approach 1 of g of x, it looks like it's going to be a 2. You know, if I was a betting man, that's what I would say. And if you take the right limit, as x approaches 1 from the right of g of x, well, again, I would say it's going to be a 2, right? That's what you would expect. The left limit, the right limit, they both exist. They both agree. So we would say that the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x here, we expect that to be 2. That's the expectation. But when we actually reveal back, right, we, 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 we go visit our friend in the hospital and they injured their face. We expect that person when they take off the bandage to be Harvey Dent. But no, when they pull off the bandage, it turns out they're Two-Face now. It wasn't what we expected. We couldn't have predicted that by looking at what happens near x equals 1. Because the behavior near x equals 1 was predicting it was going to be y equals 2. But it turned out it was y equals 3. Who would have guessed? And so this is what limits are all about. Limits are trying to calculate the expectation, the trend of a function. They don't actually measure what the function actually does.